Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland and this is Relaxation Hypnosis for Stress, Anxiety and Panic Attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. Now this is going to be a more of a chatty recording. And there's a couple of ideas that I've uh, that I've come well not I've come up with but that have stimulated my brain. Uh, and this is going to be one of them. And, and it's something that I heard, I think it was yesterday or the day before, on a, a speech that I was listening to. It's like an audio book. I think it was Brian Tracy, but it might have been Earl Nightingale. I'm not 100% sure. But just this one story got me thinking and the story really is that well, I don't know if this is true today but in the past elephants baby elephants in circuses were put in chains like one of their legs would be put in a chain and it would be strong enough to hold the baby elephant. But as the elephant got bigger and older, and it'd be a big, strong adult weighing, you know, weighing the same as like a bus or more, it would be controlled by a chain attached to its leg which wasn't strong enough to hold it, that it could have easily broken out of, but it didn't because it didn't believe it could. The elephant only knows and believes that because he couldn't get out of the chain when he was a baby, when he was little, that therefore he can't get out of the chain now. And you might be thinking, what on earth is this bloke talking about elephants for? What's that got to do with anxiety and stress? Well, the first thing you'd say here, I imagine having your leg chained up would be very stressful, wouldn't it? But that's not really that's not really the point of the of the discussion, but it got me thinking about and that was kind of the point of the story in the sense of limiting beliefs. Believe in something that we used to believe in. Something that's no longer the case. So I started thinking about that from a, you know, a, a mental health perspective, anxiety, stress, perspective and so that's where I'm coming from with this it's kind of my own perspective and I'll just see what, what ideas come up really it reminds me a little bit of when I was a kid I was about 13 maybe 14 and our family got a uh, St Bernard dog which is one of the biggest dogs in the world. One of the biggest species of dog is huge. And this little, this dog, we had it from, she was called Misty, and we had her from a puppy. So she was tiny, you could hold her in your hands for the first two days. You know, she just grew, like doubled in size every three hours. You know, it's just really got big really quickly. And... I'd be taking her for a walk, or she'd be taking me for a walk. But what was weird is she'd see a dog that was not even the core of her size. 
can she be all submissive and not lay on her back and sort of give in and be sort of be scared because she thought she was still little she didn't realise she was the biggest dog in that town apart from perhaps I guess her parents she was bigger than me within sort of about 10 months she weighed weighed more than me but she didn't know that she was big because she still had that idea that she was this little puppy so that's my own kind of version of the elephant story and but it got me thinking so this big strong one of the strongest animals if not the strongest land animal on the planet an elephant I suppose nothing I mean I suppose only a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros would sort of come close to, but not as not as strong, but like as far as like hugeness or a giraffe. Anyway, this is, <laughs> this is not a wildlife podcast. Um, so it just got me thinking about the what do we still believe about ourselves it's no longer true what do we still what belief limiting belief do we still hold on to which is restricting our lives restricting our freedom restricting our sense of safety that's no longer relevant to us something that's affecting our mental well-being and I suppose I I was thinking about it from a a stress and anxiety perspective solely although it reaches everything you know as far as things like relationships uh, education, the way we are at work, our self-esteem, you know, self-belief and all that stuff. So, I suppose it's like a little bit of an exploratory conversation to, you know, get me thinking, maybe to get you thinking about your life and about your times of stress and anxiety and how much of that is actually outdated. How much of those responses are out of proportion and outdated? So, you know, for example, if um, if, a, if a small child came up to you and threatened to beat you up, you wouldn't be scared, would you? Not now, but maybe when you was a little kid, you might be. So if a 10-year-old walks up to you and said, I want to knock you out. Just laugh at them, wouldn't you? So, yeah, all right then. Go away. But when you were eight or seven years old, that ten-year-old would be scary. But they're not now. But imagine if we hadn't grown to realise that. If we'd stayed in that that mindset if we still clung on to that belief that that a 10 year old is is scary. That'd be a really quite an unusual lifestyle to live, wouldn't it? Being scared when you saw a 10 year old walking down the street. 
and I'm pretty sure that there's hardly any adult that would be scared of a, a small child. So, I wonder how many things there are that are holding us back. I'm not saying that we're, or that you're stuck in the past, although the past can be a bit sticky at times. And just in case you're wondering, any background sounds is Andre snoring. He's basically gone to sleep upside down. Just took a picture of him and put it on Facebook. He's he makes some weird noises when he's asleep. So there's something quite powerful, um, I think, about the if you actually focus on the image of that elephant, big, strong, powerful creature that could break those chains in a second if it wanted to, but doesn't know it can. So what, what chains do we have on us And what are those chains? I do sometimes wonder if the anxiety is sometimes can feel like a like an invisible leash, you know, like a chemical leash, but it's a, I guess it is chemical, so it comes from our brains, doesn't it? But some kind of invisible harness that's trying to control us there was another thing I saw years ago Tales of the Unexpected and there was this man and he he had a pet shop but downstairs in the cellar he had all these exotic animals uh, like lions mainly like big big cats tigers, lions and he had them in cages all the cages were electrocuted and uh, the cages were electrified yet the cage doors were open but there was uh, I suppose like a force field or whatever you know so if the animal went near the door it would give it an electric shock And this, uh, I think part of the story was this shopkeeper, the pet shop owner, was showing someone around. So look at my animals, look. And uh, he said, don't worry, it's all electrocuted. Well, you know, they know they can't get out because they've, they've been stung enough times. So they know that it's not going to, they can't. Uh, it'll be painful for them to try and even touch go anywhere near the door of the cage they're more like cells actually like little prison cells and then after taking the person upstairs he said I'll let you in a little secret and he, sh- and he opens up the uh, the control box the fuse box he said all the electricity's turned off. The animals don't even know it. They just think they're going to get a shock. So that's why they don't go near the door. That's why they don't try to escape. Because they don't believe they can. 
And this is something that uh, is a very kind of Pavlovian, is it Ivan Pavlov that experimented with all this stuff uh, in the, you know, in the past. And there's a lot of sort of techniques in NLP, also hypnosis, that kind of works on this premise that we have built up these limitations ourself and sometimes it's about breaking that limitation so this self limitation that's out of date completely out of date and breaking it you know basically pushing it so you realize it's out of date testing it so one thing could be i could say yeah i'm i can still ride the bmx bike that i had when i was 12 of course it's such a long time ago that bmx bike has probably turned to dust but you know if i did get hold of that bike I'm a lot bigger than I was when I was 12. Not only taller, but probably three times as heavy. So the reality check there would, would actually be me trying to get on that bike. And then I'd know there'd be no doubting because the bike would probably just crumble underneath me. And that would be a very simple test. And the brain, our brains are so good. Because we can actually have one trial learning. So I remember I had, for example, a panic attack in, it was in a bookshop. And after that, I didn't, I didn't go into that bookshop again, or I couldn't even go near it without having that tingle, that sense of, oh no, it's going to happen again, that kind of thing. Which just shows how intelligent we are. I'm not just talking about myself, I'm talking about all of us. That if we can learn something so quickly, that's a sign of real intelligence. And to break something doesn't necessarily mean unlearning it. You could learn something that's the opposite to it. In the same way that a positive thought and a negative thought cannot be in your mind at the same time. You can't hold both thoughts at the same time. It's impossible. I mean, the thoughts happen so quickly, so it might seem in some ways like it's there at the same time because they flow rather quickly at times. But the reality is you can't have both. Just like you can't force relaxation. You can't, you can't make yourself love somebody. You, you know, you can't uh, tell yourself that you like a Marmite sandwich or peanut butter sandwich or some kind of food that just disgusts you. Or that you don't like. It doesn't have to disgust you, but it might just be something that you really don't like. Over time, you could learn to like it. Because we can become accustomed to things. We get used to stuff. I think anxiety and stress is one of those things that we seem to be able to get used to. And why should we? 
there's, I suppose, a bit of a fine line between getting used to anxiety levels being too high and acceptance, self-acceptance. Because the self-acceptance, of course, is always going to be important. That's how things are now. That's who I am. But doesn't mean that's how I'm going to be tomorrow. You know, everything that's happened up till now has made me who I am now. But I decide what happens tomorrow. The past doesn't dictate the future. You do. You do. You know, you choose what you do next. And I, I'm sticking to that. And I have done for years. Every second of every day, we choose what we do next. And you can argue and argue and argue. And I've got, I've got a comeback for every single argument. And when I say you choose what you do next, I'm not talking about an illness situation. You know, that sort of someone so... Well, if someone's got uh, lung cancer and is coughing, is he choosing to cough? No, I'm not talking that kind of situation. Nothing like that. I'm talking about our actions, our behaviours. And then someone will say, well, what if someone puts a gun to your head and says you've got to kneel down? You've got to do it, haven't you? Well, no, you don't have to do it. But you choose to do it in order to save your life. You choose to... It's still a choice. Well, I've got to go to work because I've got 500 children to support. You don't have to go to work. You choose to go to work because you choose to support those children. You know, it's... In some ways, it's absurd... Because you say, well, life doesn't work like that. Well, actually, it still is a choice. You choose to believe that life doesn't work like that. It's a choice. Everything we do is a choice. And the benefit for that, for me, I personally think, the benefit, possibly the only benefit or the main benefit of realising that we choose what we do next is... We can't blame anyone else. We stop blaming other people. And trust me, I love blaming other people. I'd blame other people for every single thing that's ever happened that didn't go right for me. If I could. If I, unfortunately, I'm too intelligent to do it. Because I know that that's not true. It's... I know that it's not helpful, it's not healthy, and it's just not true either. And there's situations were, which were out of my control. But blaming other people doesn't help me. As long as you don't blame yourself. I think that's the point. I think, I think some people think that... You have to blame someone. Someone has to be to blame. So if you don't blame another person, that means you've got to blame yourself. Blaming yourself is real crappy. It's much better to blame another person. But why, why is that the only two options? It doesn't make sense, does it? The only two options. So, I'd say neither of those are an option. We take responsibility for what we've done. But blaming... For me, it's all about learning. You know, if I, let's say, for example, I lent someone some money a couple of weeks back. 
and they kept phoning for more money, saying that they needed to get a train back from where they were and they were stranded. And I, I sent, I think, £60 in the end over about four days. Now, I was... They, they didn't want the money for that. So... I could ignore that. I got the money back, most of it. But I could... I could learn from it. I could blame them. I could blame myself. I had a go at myself for being so... Oh, I'm so stupid. And... But I, I don't like being called stupid. I genuinely don't like it. It doesn't feel nice. And... For me, I mean, maybe you love it, but I doubt it. Yeah, I bet you call yourself stupid at times. I know that I do. Not you, me, I call myself. In fact, you know what I said earlier to Andre? He's my ferret, he's my little boy. I was outside, just going out the door, and I've got, you know, I'm trying to hold him while I'm locking the front door to take him for a walk that he's been hassling me for. And he jumps out of my hands and lands on the floor, which is concrete. Splash right on the floor from my shoulder, which is... It's got to be nearly the equivalent of me jumping out of this window onto the grass. It's quite a distance for him, for his, you know, he's only little. And I picked him up. He was looking at me. He looked a bit dazed. Luckily, he was okay. And I, I picked him up and said, uh, you're an idiot. What are you? I nearly said, you're an idiot. I nearly said, what are you? And suddenly, I was like, Wow. That's what my dad used to say to me when I was a kid. Get me to say it back. Not only say, you're an idiot, but then, what are you? I have to say, I'm an idiot. We, but I didn't realise I didn't have to say it. Because when I was 15, he said it to me. You're an idiot, what are you? I said, no, I'm not. And he said, well, why did you do that then? And it ended up being a conversation. I didn't know that option was there. I didn't know I had options. For me, it was avoiding him calling me an idiot or him calling me an idiot and me saying, yeah, I'm an idiot. That was the only... I didn't know there was another option, which was... Well, actually, there's just one option, really, that I thought I had. And when I stood up to him, he almost seemed pleased. I didn't, like, physically stand up to him, because... At that time, he was a giant compared to me. But even still, that's another weird thing. At 49, I still see my dad as this big, strong, scary man. And when I say scary, I mean physically he was always big and always tiny. And even now, I see him as this big, strong man, yet... I'm as big as him. Maybe even heavier, but he's... But, you know, we've kind of got the same kind of frame. But he's a bit taller than me. We've both got the same belly, big beer belly. And a similar thing with my nan. When she was alive, she... 
I suppose she had to be alive to talk to me, didn't she? But she'd say to me, I used to visit her and sometimes she'd like, tell me off, not horribly, but, and I would regress to being a little child. Like I'd, be, I'd be sort of nine or ten again, or seven. But I quite liked it. I think sometimes that can be quite nice. But not if it gets in the way of your of your life, of your happiness. So what what is there, do you think, that if you can think of a specific thing that is connected to anxiety that you have or stress that you have pertaining you know, to a, you know, a certain situation, for example, talking to new people, uh, the list is endless. I can't, don't want to just read off a million different things. But something that holds you back, that limits you, that gets in the way of your happiness, your growth. Because I think that the general public, I'm being very generalised here, generalistic, would class, oh, anxiety, that's for the people that have anxiety attacks and um, can't leave their house or, you know, sort of that, that seems to be how I think a lot of people think of anxiety. When actually everybody has anxiety at certain points. It just might not be for, it might not be in the form of an anxiety attack. But there's a lot of people out there that are living really happy lives, would class themselves as mentally healthy and maybe spiritually healthy you know everything's going well in their lives maybe they don't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and that might be because the thought of talking to someone new a new man or a new woman in a club, in a pub, in a restaurant, on a first date, even a friend of a friend, just anything like that, absolutely terrifies them. On a level of anxiety that stops them from doing it. And the reason perhaps they don't think of it as being Anxiety is because they don't allow it to happen. They don't allow themselves to feel it because they stop before they even get close to doing it. To doing that thing that they feel is going to cause them all that emotional pain. And I've no doubt we've all got everyone has got something. I, I think for a lot of people it comes in the form of phobias or superstitions. I mean, I, I don't like snakes or big spiders, big spiders, you know, things like that. I don't like them. Or crocodiles, I don't. It's just a personal preference. But... It doesn't affect my life at all. Now, if I lived in Australia or somewhere where there was a lot of, there's a chance that I'm going to be seeing one of those creatures, then I'd need to sort myself out. But I live in a country where we don't really have stuff like that, just stop walking around, wandering around. There are no crocodiles here other than in zoos. So 
I guess it's quite easy for some people to feel, I wouldn't say superior, but to, to maybe feel that they're the well ones because they don't need to face their fears because their fears may be jumping out of a plane, you know, with a parachute or flying. I think most people, if they wanted to, could avoid never flying in a plane. It's not, it's not fair, you know, everyone could get away with it, but uh, I know I can. I don't never ever need to fly in a plane if I choose not to. I have been on planes. I never need to learn to swim. I can't actually swim, not very well. But I don't live anywhere near the sea. I'm never going to need those, you know, skills. But if I was going to be travelling on boats, then I need to be able to swim. So I think it can be, I'm not going to say easy, but easier in some ways for somebody to have a phobia if that phobia is not affecting their life. But if that phobia is pigeons, for example, or dogs, then that's a different thing altogether because dogs are everywhere. You know, around here, this all you see is dog walkers. Well, you see more dog, yeah. They just they're everywhere. There's more dog walkers than there are trees. Oh, dogs than there are lampposts. See, I, I don't have a fear of dogs. But if I did, I do. I wouldn't want to live around here. But then, if I did, I could change it. So, if we start to look maybe at an anxiety being like a phobia, in the sense of we're scared of something, not scared, because it doesn't seem the same. So, let's say an anxiety of being in a supermarket around lots of different people. I don't like it myself, don't like it, uh, but I, I've got ways to control, you know, how I'm feeling, and uh, I've talked about it in the past, I wear headphones to cancel out the noise, the, the noise, the sound of people, because I seem to be quite sensitive with sound. Uh, which has probably got nothing to do with anxiety or stress, just to do with the way that my my brain is. Just, you know, it's the way I'm wired. But it, who knows? It might be to do with the mental health issues I've got. I, who, who knows what it is? could be a mixture of different things. But those kinds of things, I think it's harder if it's a daily kind of situation, if it's just a standard thing. For first of all, people, other people, a lot of people, okay, I'm generalizing, won't or won't even try to comprehend how someone could be anxious queuing to pay for their shopping. I mean, it would seem ridiculous to a lot of people. It doesn't seem ridiculous to me, but for a lot of people, it would do. Because they don't understand it, they've never been there, they've never, they don't understand it. And it's not their fault. You know, the reality is, if we really tried to be What's the right word? I suppose empathic or 
if we try to understand everybody else's situation, in order to do that, we would need to live for quite a few hundreds and thousands of years because there's too many different people with too many different things going on. We're not going to understand. It's just in the same way if... If you stood on, if you just stood on a stage and did a talk and just talked for five minutes about anything, uh, maybe about your life, about what you like, or you know, and um, providing you know you haven't got stage fright or anything like that, which a majority of people do seem to have for some reason, and. Um, The thing is, somebody's going to be annoyed, probably. Someone's, someone out there is going to think, didn't like that, didn't like what they said. So you might have 99% of the people thinking that you're great, or yeah, I like that person. But you never can have everybody. And I suppose it's a bit of a bitter pill but the reality is it's probably never going to be 99% either. It's going to be, you're never going to know what percentage of people could be affected by what you say. But why let that stop your talking? I learned years ago, years and years as a child, that I used to say stuff that upset people, and I didn't mean to. And then I started doing it on purpose. Generally, you know, when I needed to, in a sense of defending myself. And then when I got older, I started doing it on purpose, just for fun. I don't do it anymore. And I don't know why I'm laughing, because it's not, it's, it wasn't so much being cruel, just um, as a wind up really, I guess, just as a, being a bit cheeky. Or if someone had been rude to me, then I'd I'd have endless, you know, my mouth wouldn't stop. I just, I don't know why. It's it's a gift, I guess. A gift that keeps on uh, taking away, keep, keep getting me in trouble. So, we still have to talk. Not everybody's going to like what we say. Not everybody listening to my recordings like what I say. Not everybody's going to, someone listening for the first time, they may listen to me and think, he sounds like Donald Duck. Who knows? I might sound like some, uh, someone from the past that hurt them, you know? I'm not that person, but if I sound like them, they're probably not going to want to listen to me. It's, they might, if you know, if they can get their head around the the similar sound, realizing that I'm not that person. But that's it'd be a good thing to break because. You know, racism and prejudice can be caused by a person being hurt. Let's say a person being hurt by the opposite sex has caused many people to be full of hate towards all members of the opposite sex, or a lot of them, when actually it's that one person, or maybe a couple of people, as the ones that have hurt them. And it goes back to the whole blame again, doesn't it? We need to blame someone. And sometimes blaming one person isn't enough. And it's easier to maybe just blame a whole section of people. Makes life easier. I can see that in a sense. 
you know, if you say, well, I'm not going to talk to anybody that has freckles. I now hate people with freckles or I won't talk to anyone that's under five foot nine, which includes me, actually. It makes life... I wouldn't say it would make life easier, but it makes it simpler, very simplistic for the person. They decide that anyone with blonde hair is... and whatever. You could just fill in the gap. You know, everyone with blonde hair is a certain type of person. Well, we know that's not true. But when someone's had, had something done bad to them and they've got anxiety, trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, I mean, rightly, they shouldn't blame themselves because it isn't their fault. And I've seen sort of both sides of that, the blaming other people and then blaming themselves. And I've seen someone go from wanting to physically hurt another person when they're blaming the other person. But then when they blame themselves, physically wanting to hurt themselves. It needs to be a third option. It really does, because neither of those scenarios are going to work out good for anybody involved, but specifically for the person who we're discussing, who whoever that is, blame themselves is potentially life-threatening and by blaming the other person even though it may well be their fault but keeping that going keeping that energy that hatred that anger keeping it going is actually it is just like a poison it really is and there's stuff that I've not I'm not able to let go of yet hopefully I will but I've let go of some stuff. And it is freeing. It is. And there is that kind of uh, the idea that and I'm I'm not talking about suicide potentially, or just the idea of it being it's actually murder. It's still murder, but you're aiming it at the wrong person. But of course, we shouldn't murder less, you know, obviously. But it's, there has to be another way. Not just A or B, both of which will cause you huge suffering. There has to be one or the other, which means you've got options. Which means that those limitations like that elephant in a cage or not even in a cage just standing there outside a trailer in the sunshine or in the rain wishing it could go over and perhaps run around in the field but he can't because it's got that tiny little chain stopping him even though that chain couldn't stop an adult human, never mind a, an elephant. So what, what old, old thought patterns, old limitations are getting in the way of us and We'll be getting in the way of us releasing some of that stress, some of that anxiety, letting it go or reducing it. What's getting in the way of us remembering that we 
decide what we do every second of every day. You know, you always choose what you do next. As far as your behaviour, what you do next is your choice. Even though it doesn't seem like it a lot of the time. But when you realise it is your choice, I think it makes it easier. Because it's it's no longer an A or B, this or that. I have to go to work, for example, I have to go to work because I've now got 700 children to support. I have to go to work and do this job I don't like. Or I have to leave the job and lose everything. Then being the only two options. Or you could go to work, decide, and remember that you're doing it and why you're doing it. And you're choosing to do it, so you're no longer a victim in that situation. And then you can make plans from there, remembering that things are always changing. Nothing stays the same, ever. It's amazing. I I had this job in this call centre, and I would... I would have bet you any amount of money that my manager would be there forever. He was a company man. Genuinely thought he would, maybe not forever, but I thought he was going to be there for a long time. One day he came in and said he got another job. I couldn't believe it. I genuinely thought he was, he just, you know, he loved the place. He'd be in early in the morning, stay late. He, you know, he loved it. What well, I thought he did. So that it, that's probably an example of someone that chose to go in to give himself time to look at other options instead of just. Going in, feeling sorry for himself, being a victim or not going in ever again. And again, I suppose, feeling sorry for himself and being a victim. And I've done both of those. I've left many jobs in the past because I couldn't face going in. Because I thought I had to go in. When the truth is, I never had to go in. It was always a choice. Once you've made a choice, you realise it's a choice. You're no longer... You're not... We haven't got that rope around your ankle anymore. That chain. So that elephant... It might decide to stay there. Take the chain off it. That elephant might absolutely love the people that he's around. He might be treated really well, loves being around the other animals, loves being around the kids, loves being around the, you know, the people that work at the circus and doesn't want to leave. Or he might want to go on a big rampage or he might want to go and run away or, you know, or, or, or. There isn't just one or two scenarios. It's lots of different choices. But those two choices, the, at the moment, with those chains on, he's only got one choice in his head. And that's just to stay there. He hasn't even got the, the, the luxury of two choices in his mind, but he can. If you hear a sound in the background, it sounds like someone agreeing with me, going, mm, mm, it's Andre. Probably dreaming about going for a walk 
or dreaming about biting my toes. So, it's just a few ideas, just thinking about it, thinking about from an anxiety perspective, what, what are we doing that, what, what do we believe that maybe used to be true, but it's no longer true? See, I could believe that I could jump over a fence. And unless it's like three inches high, it's not going to happen. Uh, my my fence jumping days are over. I could believe in my head that I could fit into a pair of jeans, 27 inch waist like I used to when I was probably 16. 27 inch waist. I'd struggle to get that over my thigh now. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. Well, I don't know. But, you know, I wouldn't get it. Definitely wouldn't get it over my belly. I have to wear it as a scarf or something. So those are kind of unimportant things in the sense of, like, well, obviously... You know, I've, the little car that you had, maybe, or the little bicycle you had when you was five or six, you couldn't ride that thing now. If you're an adult, that is. If you're old, older, you'd probably give it a go, but, you know, it's not the way you used to. Holes in the wall, for example. A little hole in the wall, when you're five, you can climb through a hole in the wall. Try and do it when you're 45, and you're like five times, ten times bigger. It's not going to happen. And no matter how much you believe it, it makes no difference. So wouldn't it be good if we could get more in touch with those things? Sort of similar kind of things that are obvious. Obviously, of course, I wouldn't even attempt to do that because I'm physically not able to do that stuff anymore. I can't bite my own toenails. Why would I want to? Why would anyone want to? Why am I even mentioning it? But I used to be able to. I can't now. I mean, I'm thinking of sort of getting married so that I can have someone to help me cut my toenails now as it is. I struggle to reach. I have to hold my breath for each toe. But I used to be able to stick my toes right in my mouth. However gross that, yeah. Ugh. I can't do that now. And... The only way I could do that is by causing some pretty serious damage to my legs. It's all in order, you know, in order to do it. And I'm not prepared to do that. Not just for the sake of an audio recording. So there's that kind of standard thing. But don't we... Is it, you know, maybe there's the also part of us that gets annoyed at that. Like, well, I should be able to still fit in my wedding dress or the suit I wore at my um, graduation or, you know, whatever it is. Like, why? Why should you be the same size as you were 20 years ago? Why? Why? 
Why should you look the same? We don't. We don't look the same. We look older because we're supposed to. It's natural. It's like that's what life's about. It's you know, we look older. We our bodies shape, change shape sometimes in a different way to what we'd expect. I mean, I never thought that I'd look like a pregnant gorilla, but here I am. I'm a little bit hairier, but it's sometimes it, I know it could be. It sounds a bit strange. Sometimes you can listen to. I don't know about you, but I can listen to something. I like listening to motivational, um, kind of self-help audio books and. I like to hear different ideas and maybe it stimulates my thoughts. It sort of stimulates my thinking and how does that fit in with how I live my life? There was some the other day someone said, if... If you were told from now on, you had to live every day for the rest of your life, except or for the rest of eternity, every day is going to be exactly like tomorrow. So whatever you do tomorrow, when you wake up, whatever you do during those 24 hours, you're going to be repeating that forever and ever and ever how would you spend that day knowing that you had to repeat it and I guess the one thing is you'd well I'd probably avoid anything that was unpleasant I'm not sure how I would spend that day You know, part of me would think, okay. There's, there's a little part of me that thinks, well, I'm going to live that day for eternity. So it doesn't matter what I do, so I can be as unhealthy as poss- as I want. And not have to worry about it. So I could be eating ice cream all day, every day, for the rest of eternity. Without getting ill. But... At the same side, it's like that's going to get very old very quickly. Even your favourite ice cream, having it all the time. And I found that out when um, I had tonsillitis when I was a kid and I could only eat ice cream for about five days. To be fair, that's not really a good example because I still love ice cream. But if I didn't like ice cream, that'd be a good story. <laughs> but I went off it for a while. I went off it, you know. So oh, I really don't want any more ice cream. But we've got some jam roly poly. See if ice cream or custard. Okay, I'll have some ice cream then. The changes seem to happen naturally and my, I think my advice my, more my, not my advice so much my uh, suggestion to you is how do you feel at the end of the recording, uh, when you've listened to me, how do you feel afterwards compared to how you felt before? How do you feel during compared to how you felt before? And and then in the coming days, how what do you start to notice 
about changes that have happened. It's it's almost like they've happened on their own, which they you know, kind of have. But at the same time, I think there's a certain state of mind that we get into when we're talking. I know you're not necessarily talking, it's not a conversation as such, but there is a communication, there is an energy there between me and you, a direct connection of energy. When that happens, by pressing the play button, you give permission for my voice and my ideas, my silly talking and stuff, you give permission for that to enter into your mind. You give permission. You sort of, you've invited me into your home, you know, and you know, if you open the door, you've welcomed me in. And when you come back again for another recording, it's like an old friend, it's like you've, okay, you know, um, you don't have to tell me where the bathroom is because now I know. So it's kind of, I might still say, it's okay if I, I need to do a poo. And you might say, well, did you have to tell us that at the dinner table? Can you just say, you need to use the bathroom? And I'll say, I'll remember that for next time. So, but you you got that familiarity. You got that sense of, especially if you listen to me regularly, you get a sense of kind of knowing me on a certain level and things change. Now, things are going to change anyway. But I think, it, now I've got this belief that something about the mindset, something about your mindset when you're listening to me the changes, really changes, makes changes, and you feel differently. And you might think, oh, what? you know, it might not be tomorrow, it might be day after, who knows, but you might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, why doesn't that thing bother me anymore? And I know that I'm a bit like that sometimes. If, for example, if I've had, um, if say if I had some physical pain, and it's it's gone, and I'll try and get it back again. Like, why would I want it back? Yeah, it's like because I've done hypnosis on myself for headaches, for different pain, physical pains over the years, and I'll try and get it back. It's like why. I've just spent 10 minutes, you know, getting myself all relaxed and getting rid of this physical um, discomfort that was there before. Why am I trying to get it back? So there's, there's kind of no logic in that, but at the same time, it's kind of funny. Uh, I suppose there's, maybe there's something in us that we want to test. We like to test stuff. And I think maybe the results, the, the actual test is how you feel inside, physically, emotionally, how you feel when you listen to me. That is something that I think is could be the grade, could be the, the marker for you to see and feel um, and know that you benefit in. And it can be a gradual thing. I'm very much into sort of very gentle, uh, very slow. You probably noticed that. I, I, very, I do things slowly. Uh, which is part of the reason why I make quite a few recordings and also quite long some of them as this is because I'm not in a rush 
really not in a rush. And I think if you go slowly, you're not, whatever part of you that may have been on guard before, looking out on guard a little bit, tense, maybe a little bit curious, a little bit, uh, that goes away. Because, well, first of all, if you listen regularly, you're listening for a reason. And, you, you know, no one would listen twice if they didn't like listening. And I have a lot of people listening. Because I'm a superstar. No, I'm joking. But perhaps you can notice changes in how you feel going forward. Because when I say go forward, I mean I don't mean that you walk backwards. Just you know, as you move into the future, which is the only place that we can move into. And that's the thing, it's the old saying, isn't it? If, you, if you're constantly looking behind you, you're going to keep tripping up. You only need to be able to look where you're going. Yeah, that happened to me. I remember I was looking behind me and I, I walked into a lamppost. One of those old concrete lampposts from the 80s, the 1980s, not the 1880s. And I don't know if they had concrete back then, did they? Or lampposts even. But yeah, I walked into it and I ended up with a black eye. It was very embarrassing. The thing is, I was actually laughing and making fun of someone who'd uh, just walked into a lamppost. So it's quite ironic. I'm not sure if that bit's true, but I like to think it is. Seems like quite a nice little ending to the story. A nice little lie. That's nice. So, ultimately, we're not that elephant. And maybe at times we have been, but we're not anymore. And I think the difference is with an elephant, it's that one chain. With us, we've probably got and had hundreds of the things, hundreds of those, but they're invisible. So it's about breaking away from them or realising just like my old BMX bike from when I was about 14 some of these chains are so old all you've got to do is pull them and they'll just fall apart crumble away so don't have any control or power over you. That's quite nice to know that, isn't it, as well? But there is a comfort in that. There's a comfort. I remember years ago, years and years ago, I had a job, didn't, and it was various, it was in a factory, different jobs, and I'd be put in different places. And I got so comfortable in this place, one of the departments, that they wanted to move me to a nicer one. And I said, no, I want to stay here. And it was only after probably a day of doing that new job, the new department, that I realised, why have I been in a bad mood for the whole day? Why am I missing that other department which was cold, damp, dirty, now I'm inside, it's warm, it's clean, there's people to talk to. 
And it was just a familiarity thing. I got used to it. It's not an excuse, is it really? That's not an excuse to feel crappy. Just because we're used to it. Imagine if you you fell on a pair of scissors and it hit you in the leg and the scissors are sticking out your leg. You're not going to still be walking around in 20 years' time without those scissors sticking out of your leg. Why didn't you go to the hospital? Why didn't you get... Ah, I got used to it after a while. Might as well just leave them in there. You, you wouldn't, would you? Because it would be preposterous. And I can't say that word, and I don't know why I tried to. Preposterous. Preposterous. Yeah. I'm going to stop trying to... I, I tried to say that word a few weeks ago. Preposterous. Can't say it. I'm pretty good with most words, but that one is ridiculous. That's, that's it. So things change, and the way our minds work is it can be subtle. Sometimes we don't need someone being really obvious the whole time and saying, You're going to feel this, you're going to feel that. This is going to happen when this happens, and this is going to happen. Sometimes it's nice to just, for me, it's my personal opinion, and I'm not knocking any other way of doing things. It's just, I'm very lazy. In, in a sense of, I like things to be gentle and slow. Not everything, you know, if I, if I order food in a restaurant, I want that food as quickly as possible because I'm hungry. So I don't want everything to be slow. I'm waiting for a bus and it's raining. I'm not thinking, yeah, it doesn't matter when the bus gets here. No, I want the bus here on time. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. I do, I do think that some of the biggest, most profound changes that occur can happen almost as if by themselves automatically just by having your mind open to the possibility of feeling more relaxed feeling more comfortable more often just wrapping your mind around that possibility the changes have already happened and will continue to happen. So I've managed to get about 80 minutes out of an elephant wearing a chain, so that, that's not too bad. So... I could talk probably for about another five hours on this. There's lots of ideas, but that wouldn't be fair on anyone, would it, really? <laughs> that would just, that'd just be cruel, so I won't, I won't do any more talking. What I will do is thank you for listening to me, and as I said before, just notice. Be open to noticing what changes have occurred because you were open to listening. And words are very powerful. And it's not about um, 
you will feel this way when I step my fingers through. It's about ideas. It's about... It's about hearing something positive. It's that can have a huge impact on all of our lives. Hearing something and then your mind can decide what to absorb, what's useful. Your unconscious mind can just absorb the positive stuff only the positive stuff, only the useful stuff. Now, I'm going to go. So thank you for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy. Lots of love. Bye.